Chapter 34 of Colonel Quaritch, V.C. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Colonel Quaritch, V.C. by H. Ryder Haggart. Chapter 34 George's Diplomatic Errand George carried out his intention of going to London. The morning following the day when Mr. Quest had driven to the auctioneer in the dog-cart to Honham, George might have been seen, an hour before it was light, purchasing a third-class return ticket to Liverpool Street. Arriving there in safety, he partook of a second breakfast, for it was ten o'clock, and then, taking a cab, he had driven himself to the end of that street in Pimlico, where he had gone with the fair Edithia, and where Johnny had made acquaintance with his ash-stick. Dismissing the cab, he made his way to the house with the red pillars, where he was considerably taken aback, for the place had every appearance of being deserted. There were no blinds to the windows, and on the step were muddy footmarks and bits of rags and straw, which seemed to be the litter of a recent removal. Indeed, there on the road were the broad wheel marks of the van which had carted off the furniture. He started at this with slight dismay. The bird had apparently flown, and left no address, and he had had his trip for nothing. He pressed upon the electric bell. That is, he did this ultimately. George was not accustomed to electric bells. Indeed, he had never seen one before, and after attempting in vain to pull it with his fingers, for he knew that it must be a bell, because there was the word itself written on it, he condescended to try his teeth. Ultimately, however, he discovered how to use it, but without result. Either the battery had been taken away, or it was out of gear. Just as he was wondering what to do next, he made a discovery. The door was slightly ajar. He pushed it, and it opened, revealing a dirty hall, stripped of every scrap of furniture. Entering, he shut the door and walked upstairs to the room where he had fled after thrashing Johnny. Here he paused and listened, for he thought he heard somebody in the room. Nor was he mistaken for presently a well-remembered voice shrilled out within him. "'Who's skulking about outside there?' said the voice. "'If it's one of those bailiffs, he'd better hook it, for there's nothing left here.' George's countenance positively beamed at the sound. "'Bailiffs, marm?' he sung out through the door. "'It ain't no varmity bailiffs. It's a friend. And just when you're wanting one, seemingly, can I come in?' "'Oh, yes, come in, whoever you are,' said the voice." Accordingly, he opened the door and entered, and this was what he saw. The room had, like the rest of the house, been stripped of everything, with the exception of a box and a mattress, beside which was an empty bottle and a dirty glass. On the mattress sat the fair Edithia, alias Mrs. Debeshne, alias the Tiger, alias Mrs. Quest, and such a sight as she presented George had never seen before. Her fierce face bore traces of recent heavy drinking, and was, moreover, dirty, haggard, and dreadful to look upon. Her hair was a frowsy mat, on some patches of which the golden dye had faded, leaving its natural hue, which was a doubtful grey. She had no collar on, and her linen was open at the neck. On her feet were a filthy pair of white satin slippers. On her back that same gorgeous pink satin tea-gown, which Mr. Quest had observed on the occasion of his visit, now, however, soiled and torn. Anything more squalid or more repulsive than the whole picture cannot be imagined, and though his stomach was pretty strong, and in the course of his life he had seen many a sight of utter destitution, George literally recoiled from it. "'What's the matter?' said the hag sharply. "'And who the dickens are you?' "'Ah, I know you. You're the chap who whacked Johnny.' And she burst into a hoarse scream of laughter at the recollection. "'It was mean of you, though, to hook it and leave me. "'He pulled me, the devil, and I was fined two pounds by the beak.' "'Mean of him, marm, not me. "'But he was a mean varmint altogether. "'He was, to go and pull a lady, too. "'I never heard of such a thing. "'But, marm, if I might say so, you seem to be in trouble here.' and he took a seat upon the deal-box. "'In trouble? I should think I was in trouble. There's been an execution in the house. That is, there's been three executions. One for rates and taxes, and one for a butcher's bill, and one for rent. 
They all came together, and they fought like wildcats for the duds. That was yesterday. And you see all they have left me, cleaned me out of everything, down to my new yellow satin, and then asked for more. They wanted to know where my jewelry was, but I did them there, he <laughs> he. Meaning, marm? Meaning, I hid it. That is what was left of it, under a board. But that ain't the worst. When I was asleep, that devil Ellen, who's had her share of the swag all these years, got to the board and collared the thing and bolted with them. And look what she's left me instead. And she held up a scrap of paper, a receipt for five years' wages, and she's had them over and over again. Ah, if I ever get the chance at her. And she doubled her long hand and made a motion as of a person scratching. She's bolted and left me here to starve. I haven't had a bit since yesterday, nor I drink either, and that's worse. What's to become of me? I'm starving. I shall have to go to a workhouse. Yes, me. She added in a scream, me who have spent thousands. I shall have to go to a workhouse like a common woman. It's cruel, marm, cruel," said the sympathetic George. "And you, a lawful wedded wife, till death do us part. But, marm, I saw a public over the way. Now, no offence, but you'll let me just go over and fetch a bite and a sup." Well, she answered hungrily, "You're a gent, you are, though you are a country one. You go while I make a little toilet, and as for the drink, why, let it be brandy." Brandy it shall be," said the gallant George, and departed. In ten minutes he returned with a supply of beef patties, some plates and glasses, and a bottle of good strong British brown, which, as everybody knows, is a sufficient quantity to make three privates or two blue jackets. Drunk and incapable, the woman who now presented a slightly more respectable appearance seized the bottle and, pouring about a wine glass and a half of its contents into a tumbler, mixed it with an equal quantity of water and drank it off at a draught. That's better," she said. "And now for a patty. It's a real picnic. This is." He handed her one, but she could not eat more than half of it. For alcohol destroys the more healthy appetite, and she soon flew back to the brandy bottle. Now, marm, that you are a little more comfortable, perhaps you will tell me how you got into this way, and you, with your rich husband as well as I knows, to love and cherish you. A husband to love and cherish me," she said. "Why, I have written to him three times to tell him that I'm starving, and never a penny has he given me, and there's no allowance due yet." And when there is, they'll take it, for I owe hundreds. Well," said George, "I call it cruel, cruel, and he's rolling in gold, thirty thousand pounds he has just made that I know of. You must be an angel, marm, to stand it, an angel without wings. If it were my husband, I'd know the reason why. Ah,、uh, but I daren't. He'd murder me. He said he would. George laughed gently. Lord, Lord," he said, "to see how men do play it off upon poor weak women, working on their nerves like that. He kill you, lawyer Quest kill you, and he's the biggest coward in Boisingham. But there it is. This is a world of wrong, as the parson says, and the poor shorn lambs must jam their tails down and turn their starns to the wind. And so must you, marm. So it's the workhouse you'll be in tomorrow. Well, you'll find it a poor place." The skilly is that rough. It do fair to take the skin off your throat, and not a drop of liquor, not even a cup of hot tea, and work too, lots of it, scrubbing, marm, scrubbing. This vivid picture of miseries to come drew something between a sob and a howl from the woman. There is nothing more horrible to the imagination of such people than the idea of being forced to work. If their notions of a future state of punishment could be got at. They would be found in nine cases out of ten to resolve themselves into a vague conception of hard labor in a hot climate. It was the idea of the scrubbing that particularly affected the tiger. I won't do it," she said. "I'll go to Chokey first." "Look here, marm," said George in a persuasive voice, and pushing the brandy bottle towards her. "Where's the need for you to go to the workhouse or to Chokey either?" You with a rich husband as is bound by law to support you as becomes a lady, and marm, mind another thing, a husband as has wickedly deserted you, 
which how he could do so ain't for me to say, and is living along of another young party. She took some more brandy before she answered. That's all very well, you duffer, she said. But how am I to get at him? I tell you, I'm afraid of him, and even if I weren't, I haven't a cent to travel with, and if I got there, what am I to do? As for being afraid, marm, he answered, I've told you Lawyer Quest is a long sight more frightened of you than you are of him. Then as for money, why, marm, I'm going down to Boisingham myself by the train that leaves Liverpool Street at half-past one, and that's an hour from now. And it's proud and pleased I should be to take a lady down, and by the means of bringing them, as has been in holy matrimony, together again. And as to what you should do when you get there, why, you should just walk up with your marriage lines, and say, You are my husband, and I call on you to cease living in sin, and to take me back. And if he don't, why then? You swears an information, and it's a case of warrant for bigamy. The tiger chuckled, and then, suddenly seized with suspicion, looked at her visitor sharply. What do you want me to blow the gaff for? she said. You're a leery old hand, you are, for all your simple ways, and you've got some game on. I'll take my davy. I, a game, I, answered George, an expression of the deepest pain spreading itself over his ugly features. No, marm, and when one has wanted to help a friend, too. Well, if you think that. And no doubt misfortune has made you suspicious. The best I can do is to bid you good-bye, and to wish you well out of your troubles. Workhouse and all, marm, which I do according. And he rose from his box with much dignity, politely bowed to the hag on the mattress, and then turning, walked towards the door. She sprang up with an oath. I'll go, she said. I'll take the change out of him. I'll teach him to let his lawful wife starve on a beggarly pittance. I don't care if he does try to kill me. I'll ruin him. And she stamped upon the floor and screamed, I'll ruin him. I'll ruin him presenting such a picture of abandoned evil and wickedness that even George, whose nerves were not finely strung, inwardly shrank from her. "'Ah, oh, marm,' he said, "'no wonder you're put out. When I think of what you've had to suffer, I own it makes my blood go boiling through my veins. But if you are a-coming, perhaps it would be as well to stop cursing and put your hat on, for we have got to catch the train.' and he pointed to a headgear chiefly made of somewhat dilapidated peacock feathers and an ulster which the bailiffs had either overlooked or left through pity. She put on the hat and cloak, and then, going to the hole beneath the board, out of which she said the woman Ellen had stolen her jewellery, she extracted the copy of the certificate of marriage which that lady had not apparently thought worth stealing, and put it in the pocket of her pink silver peignoir. Then George, having first secured the remainder of the bottle of brandy, which he put into his capacious pocket, they started, and, finding a hansom, drove to Liverpool Street. Such a spectacle as the tiger looked upon the platform, George was wont, in after days, to declare he never did see. But it can easily be imagined that a fierce, dissolute, hungry-looking woman with half-dyed hair, who had drunk as much as was good for her, dressed in a hat made of peacock feathers, dirty white shoes, an ulster with some buttons off, and a gorgeous but filthy pink silk tea-gown, presented a sufficiently curious appearance, especially when contrasted with her companion, the sober and melancholy-looking George, who was arrayed in his pepper-and-salt Sunday suit. So curious, indeed, was their aspect that the people loitering about the platform collected round them, and George, who was heartily ashamed of the position, was thankful enough when once the train started. He had, from his motives of economy, taken her a third-class ticket, and at this she grumbled, saying that she was accustomed to travel like a lady should, first, but he appeased her with the brandy-bottle. All the journey through he talked to her about her wrongs, till at last, what, between the liquor and his artful incitements, she was inflamed into a condition of savage fury against Mr. Quest. When once she got to this point, he would let her have no more brandy, seeing that she was now ripe for his purpose, 
which was, of course, to use her to ruin the man who had ruined the house he served. Mr. Quest, sitting in state as clerk to the magistrates, assembled in quarter sessions at the session house in Boisingham, little guessed that the sword at whose shadow he had trembled all these years was even now falling on his head, or that the hand that cut the hair that held it was that of the stupid bumpkin whose warning he had despised. End of chapter 34